right, good morning, everyone. My name is Maria Mahan. I am with the Middle Alabama Area Agency on Aging, and this is our Take a Stand for Caregivers. We are going to be talking about brain health. Our speaker today is Miller Piggott, who is the Executive Director at the Alzheimer's of Central Alabama. Miller is a founding member of the Alzheimer's Central Alabama ACA and has served as the organization's only executive director since 1997. ACA is a local organization helping local families over the past 30 years. ACA has grown to be one of the largest local dementia-related nonprofit organizations serving Alabama's 93,000 Alzheimer's patients. The mission is to provide services, education, research, and advocacy. ACA was established to promote research and provide services for local families across the 21 counties of central Alabama, living with dementia in its many forms. ACA helps families who cannot afford the most basic necessities like nutrition, incontinence supplies, and respite care. I want to first thank Ms. Carlette Smith of Human Resource Options, who will be providing our CEUs today. And her email is provided. I'll also put that in the chat um, to make sure that you send your survey at the end of the session and get those CEUs. That's a must. Some CEU housekeeping rules. All evaluations must be sent to the Human Resource Options email. Your information submitted should be listed as what is recorded at your licensing board, home address and personal cell phone number, not your business address. Evaluations must be submitted within 24 hours after the class, no exceptions. If not submitted within the time frame, no certificate will be provided. For those who are sharing a room to view the meeting, each person does need to register for the class, complete the class evaluation, and note it in the chat box to the hostess of the meeting that you are in a group. We want all attendees to receive their CEUs. If you phone in, if you phone in, not Zoom, please identify your phone number that you called from to cross-reference. Anyone who has not registered and their name or phone number is not in the Zoom report, you cannot receive a certificate. The Alabama Aging Network operates in all 67 counties of the state of Alabama. The Middle Alabama Area Agency on Aging, or M4A, is one of 13 local area agencies on aging. The overall mission is to age in place within the community. 90% of adults age 65 and older want to stay in their home. Aging and Disability Resource Center, or ADRC, serves as a single point of entry to long-term care services and support services. It works to empower people to make informed decisions about their long-term care supports and services throughout. You can call 1-800-AGE-LINE to be connected to your local AAA. Some of the services that we offer here at M4A and other area agencies on aging include nutrition services, caregiver support, medication assistance, insurance counseling, senior employment, legal services, elder abuse prevention, and long-term care support. Well, um, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you, and I want to thank Maria and everyone at M4A for including um, Alzheimer's of Central Alabama in their schedule to take a stand for caregivers. Um, you know, this is so is such an interesting topic to me. I have been involved in Alzheimer's care since 1990. That's when I started at UAB and the Center for Aging and um, was a part of the Alzheimer Family Program. And back then, we were all thinking that 30 years from then, we would have had a cure for Alzheimer's. That's what everyone was, was vying for and hoping for. Um, but we find that today we're still living with Alzheimer's. I want to start with um, um, defining sort of these two terms um, because I use them interchangeably. Um, what is dementia versus Alzheimer's disease? Well, dementia has been called an umbrella term. Lots of different things cause dementia. Alzheimer's causes 60 to 80 percent of all dementias. 
Um, one of the things I did when I was at UAB was um, help recruit people to participate in the brain resource program. That was a, a, a brain collection uh, for, for samples that were used for, uh, for research. And what we found here in Birmingham and what was also found at other centers across the country is that most people actually had a mixed dementia, meaning they had more than one kind of dementia. 45% of people with Alzheimer's are never told their diagnosis. I think that's just an interesting fact to consider. Um, the terminology has really changed because in the early years of my career, we referred to people living with Alzheimer's as patients. Um, now we are um, trying to be more sensitive to that and understand that many people living with Alzheimer's disease are in fact not patients. They're, they're up and walking around and trying to participate and be as much a part of life as they can. So we want to try to be, um, to be mindful of that. I just wanted to say, you know, one other thing that, you know, as far as um, what our job is and, and our role is to be a care partner or a caregiver as we're called on. And our job is to remember what they forget and also to remember that Alzheimer's impacts more than just memory. I wanna start with these pictures. These are brain pictures from Dr. Richard Powers, who some of you may remember worked for the Department of Mental Health and also worked at UAB for many years. And I think these pictures really help clarify for people that the brain is diseased, that the person who has Alzheimer's um, is losing function of, uh, all over their brain. It causes global cognitive decline. Um, every 65 seconds, someone in America will develop Alzheimer's disease. We know that this impacts one in nine people over age 65 and one in three people um, over age 80. Two thirds of people living with Alzheimer's are women. And if you're looking at the plus 71 crowd, 16% of the women will have um, Alzheimer's versus 11% of men. Um, Alzheimer's is the sixth leading cause of death. And interestingly, Alabama has the third highest death rate from Alzheimer's of, of all the states. Um, so the death rate from Alzheimer's has really increased in the last 20 years, while death rates from other things are on the decline. And, um, you know, this is perhaps due in, in part to, to lifestyle issues. So what we have begun to learn is that um, there are, is a lifestyle component to having a healthy brain. And it's important, as Dr. Gupta says, to stay active and to put more focus on the control center of our body, to put more focus on care for our, our brain. It's like, um, you know, we, we go to the doctor and they check out our body, but we also need to think about a checkup from the neck up. Now, the last drug that was approved for the treatment of Alzheimer's was 2004. And let that sink in a minute because, you know, there are just so many medications coming on the market for so many different diseases. But Alzheimer's has been really, really stymied in, in terms of, of, of making progress and finding a treatment. There have been over 300 um, trials that have been halted. They're very expensive, they're very time consuming. So to halt a trial is a really big deal. When Adjahem was approved in 2021, um, it, was, it has been followed by controversy ever since. Um, the drug is very expensive. Um, right now, the CDC is not paying for, is refusing to pay for Adjahem, although the VA has approved that they will. Um, and it can only be given in, um, uh, as for someone who is participating in a, in a research study, which we are very fortunate to have an Alzheimer's Center at UAB. And so we do here in Alabama have access, but still it is a matter of payment and that has continued um, to plague the, the medication. But also it has a lot of side effects. It's only intended or only uh, prescribed for people who are young and very healthy. 
uh, because it can cause brain bleeds. And so that's not something we want to do in anyone who's very frail. Um, the, there is a national plan to end Alzheimer's by 2025. I don't think we're going to reach that goal, but it's a good goal to look forward to. Um, you know, one of the things that we have seen is a real genuine increase in the amount of funding um, from the federal government for Alzheimer's research. We went from 5 million, that's million with an M, in 2013 to today, it's over 2.5 billion with a B. So you can see that um, we're trying to gear up to provide more research um, to help in finding prevention, cause, and cure. Now, just to sort of get the genetics question out of the way, there are over 80 Four genes that have been identified as playing a role in Alzheimer's. Um, the APOE gene um, is the most common. Um, if you follow much of the news, you know that Chris Hemsworth um, has, uh, had a, a genetic profile done, and he found out that he has two copies of the APOE4 gene, which dramatically increases his chance of getting Alzheimer's. But if you notice, there's still a percentage chance he won't. And so that's where lifestyle um, plays a part. So emerging research is that, um, you know, has turned really from, um, from, uh, from cure to prevention. And that has been a real game changer. And I think most experts agree that 30 to 40% of Alzheimer cases may be preventable. And that delaying onset by five years could cut in half the incidence of Alzheimer's disease. So that's really dramatic when you think about just the cost of Alzheimer's care and the toll that it takes on families. So um, lifestyle, as I said, does trump genetics. And 80% of Americans want to reduce their dementia risk but only 25% know what the risk factors actually are. Um, we do know that the brain has lots of malleability and that malleability exists throughout life. So, you know, when you make small changes at any point in your lifestyle, it can have an impact. And so that's also important to remember. There have been multiple, multiple studies on the causation and prevention of dementia. One of the things I do here at, at ACA is put out an email every Friday that has the dementia calendar, everything that's going on, all the support groups, but I also do sort of a research roundup. And in that, there is nearly always a study that has come out um, that finds that this puts you at greater risk for developing Alzheimer's or that does. Last week or two weeks ago, I think there was something that taking um, laxatives on a regular basis increases your risk of dementia. So lots of information out there. I think Dr. David Gelmacher, who's with the Alzheimer's Center at UAB, um, it says that there are more than 6,500 um, scientific articles that come out related to Alzheimer's every year. And that doesn't even include all the sort of lifestyle, diet kinds of, of articles. So there is a lot of research out there to filter through. Uh, but we do know that these are some of the things that have been um, associated with, um, with um, uh, dementia. And we're going to look at these in more detail. Um, right there in the middle at the top is midlife hearing loss. Um, this is the, the biggest risk factor for um, dementia, and it's one that we can do something about. Um, hearing loss um, impacts um, brain health more than smoking, high blood pressure, or a lack of exercise. So um, out of the Framington study, this was a huge study that um, looked at medical records of people over time, and they found that these were really important lifestyle factors. And keep this in mind when we talk um, further about the specific risk factors. A formal education, a job that has complexity to it, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, I had to get a sip of water, engaging recreation, 
exercise and diet. And the two things that are the most deadly for the brain is loneliness and isolation. <coughs> Excuse me, pardon me. Um, <clears throat> the best, <coughs> y'all, I apologize, just talking out loud like this is, wait just a minute. Okay, I hope I'm back with you. Um, <clears throat> the best public health campaign that has ever been launched, and perhaps the most successful, has centered around heart health because we all know the things that are important to keep our heart healthy. That's just been ingrained, <clears throat> ingrained in us in the last 40 years, and we know that it's it's our blood pressure, it's our weight, it's our exercising, all of these factors that we know, our cholesterol, that are important for our heart health are also impacting our brain health. And one of the first things that, that came out many years ago was that <clears throat> an important thing to keep in mind was um, reducing abdominal obesity, that that is the most deadly um, way to carry your extra weight in terms of brain health. And so males should have a 40 inch waist. A female should have a waist that's no more than 35 inches. Years ago, I used to take a basket with me with um, when I give talks. Well, that was back when we did talks in public. And um, I had strips of yarn, blue and, and pink yarn. And I tell everybody to, you know, get a piece of yarn. Y'all can take that home. And you know, we had cut those in 40 inch and 35 inch pieces, but then I realized that yarn's a little bit stretchy. So it, um, I think some people were getting a couple of extra inches um, there off of their, their yarn. Um, Alabama is not the healthiest of states. We are way down there at the bottom in terms of cholesterol, obesity, diabetes, and high blood pressure. These are all statistics that came out of UAB. And according to the Center for Disease Control, 30% of Alabamians are physically inactive. Um, when we think about diet and exercise, we know that um, it's not just what's going on in your, in your, uh, from the neck down, it's what's going on from the neck up that is impacted by exercise and diet. It increases the number of neurons helps make more fiber bundles, have more synapses so that the cells can better communicate and creates healthier uh, blood vessels overall. One of the biggest things that um, was a consequence of, of COVID was um, it created um, a real lack of social contact for many of our seniors and for many of us in general. And um, a lack of social contact really does impact our health. Uh, many studies have found that it increases the risk of dementia by 50%. It increases the risk of heart disease by 29% and increases the risk of stroke by 32%. Now, some years ago, the Lancet Commission came out with a study on intervention uh, prevention and care for Alzheimer's disease, and they identified 12 risk factors. They later went back and put these risk factors in terms of when they most impact you during your lifestyle, and that's what I'll share now. So in early life, it is, uh, it's early at lack of access to education early in life, and that has a 7% um, increased risk for developing um, Alzheimer's. So uh, remember, if we could um, could mitigate this one factor, uh, we could um, delay or prevent uh, two in five dementia cases worldwide. And the things that impact the ability to have access to an education early in life um, are generally associated with poverty, uh, 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 decreased opportunities, a poorer diet, and lower income overall. Now, one thing that we certainly know is that um, some people who are very motivated become lifelong learners. And as we said, the brain is malleable. And so to be a lifelong learner 
would be the best outcome, regardless of your exposure to formal education, young in life. In midlife, as I said, it is hearing loss. It's the biggest thing that impacts our risk for developing Alzheimer's. We are uh, making people um, five times more likely to get Alzheimer's. Um, when we think about traumatic brain injury that has received a lot of press lately with um, concussions um, being such a, a topic of conversation among NFL players and also soccer players. This has been a problem for our, our, our veterans. Um, I know some years ago there was a, uh, a bombing, uh, Iraq bombed some of our bases that were in Iran and they first said there were no injuries because there weren't traditional injuries, but many people suffered from traumatic brain injury due to the blast. And so the number of people who actually now have received disability um, who did not have physical injuries, but brain injuries from that one incident was 109. Um, you know, when we think about obesity as, um, as, as a risk factor, um, we know that 30% of Alabamians don't exercise at all, and 30% of Alabamians weigh more than 200 pounds. Later life, um, uh, smoking uh, plays the biggest role, um, and uh, smoking cessation um, worldwide could reduce the number of people living with Alzheimer's by 14%. Um, depression certainly plays a role in social isolation. And to me, I think of those things as going hand in hand. And as we've, we've talked about, social isolation really impacts our physical health. Um, air pollution has also gotten a lot of, um, of press lately um, due to, um, to, to fires, to chemical spills from from trains, you know, just what um, exposure to air pollution can do. But they find that people who live um, in places where air pollution, air quality is, is rated worse, have 10% more plaques in their brains. I want to look at a couple of different strategies for reducing dementia risk. This first one came out of the Cleveland Clinic. Um, this was six pillars to reducing our dementia risk. So these are the things that we need to be doing. And, and of course, I don't think any of these are surprising. They, it's physical exercise, um, food and nutrition that we'll talk about in, in, in a minute. Um, eat smart and think smart. That means to think about and eat with intention, things that are good for our, our brain. Uh, medical conditions and control our medical risk factors. Well, we've just learned um, the importance of um, having our hearing tested and um, taking advantage of, of changes in reimbursement for hearing devices. And this is a situation that we all need to be aware of. But uh, cholesterol, blood pressure, diabetes, um, these are all um, medical risk factors that we need to be sure that we're doing the best we can to take care of. Sleep and relaxation, we'll talk about in a minute. Um, uh, mental fitness, your mind is a use it or lose it organ, just like the rest of your body. And so you've got to keep your mind physically fit and social interaction, staying connected. Dr. Rudy Tanzi is um, a neurologist in, at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital. And you can find a lot from him online and on YouTube um, about S.H.I.E.L.D. and about his thoughts on brain health. Um, but he uses the acronym S.H.I.E.L.D., Sufficient Sleep, How You Handle Stress. And I think that's important um, a consideration as well. Interaction with friends. There you get that, um, that uh, social isolation, again, being something that we need to guard against. Exercise, learning new things, that's lifelong learn, learning and the importance of that, and a healthy diet. AARP came out with a list of the worst brain health habits, and um, starting with accentuating the negative. I think that's really um, food for thought right there. So you need to be a glass half full kind of a person and not accentuate the negative. Um, skipping vaccines, we're talking about COVID, flu, pneumonia, 
These are all very important. Drinking sugary beverages. I did not realize until I was doing the, the Friday email last Friday and there was an article I did not include, but it was on sugary beverages. And, and a, a, a can, a soft drink can, can have as much sugar as we should have in an entire day. And the most sugary drinks, the things to avoid um, are sports drinks, fruit drinks, um, of course, um, colas and canned um, sugary beverages, and then the coffee and tea that we like with so much sugar. And and as far as the coffee goes, we also tend to increase the our fat intake with what we um, doctor our coffee with. Unhealthy sleeping habits, exposure to noise. Now there goes back that link to um, to hearing. And meds that block acetylcholine, that would be medicines like Benadryl that maybe some of us are taking um, this time of year because of allergies. And lacking a sense of purpose. So you have to live with purpose. And I think, again, that's one of those factors that uh, plays a role in, um, in, in social isolation because perhaps people who are socially isolated also lack a sense of purpose. Now, Christine Locken is a, um, uh, a neuropsychologist. She is back at UAB, and ACA actually helped fund some focus groups for her that helped her develop her um, acronym for brain health. And I always like to include it because um, she includes something that the others don't, but she starts with healthy eating, um, and then emotional regulation, um, and perhaps that, again, goes back to that big risk factor, social isolation. Activities and leisure, that's where you're going to get your, your, your sleep is, is important, even though it's not spelled out here. And um, learning strategies, and learning strategies also encompasses uh, forming um, good habits where you employ all of the things that you learn about your brain health. But she also improves, includes toxin removal and the environmental work group, and that is where you can find their website, EWG, um, has lots of good information and in, related to um, all kinds of products that we use, food that we eat, and what may have toxins that we need to be careful for. Um, it is just, um, um, Parkinson's has just been named the fastest growing um, neurodegenerative disease worldwide. And they think it's because of exposure to toxins, whether that's what's in our water, what's in our soil, or what is in our, um, our air or the makeup that we use and other products like that in the home. So being aware of um, toxins in your environment and being in touch with a group like the Environmental Work Group can help you um, determine whether or not the environment that you live in is as healthy as possible. <clears throat> the benefit of games, puzzles, et cetera, um, we know that um, many of us play these games um, solo, better to do in a group because that, there we, again, we're reducing that social, um, social isolation. But these kinds of activities can build cognitive resilience and they can increase our sense of self-worth. Um, sleep is the most important eight hours of the day. Um, sleep actually um, the, the helps uh, wash away the toxins that build up in the brain over the course of a day. So it provides a restorative process for all of our hardworking systems. It is not just important for us physically, but it is important for us mentally. Now, a lot of us have problems uh, when it comes to getting good quality sleep. Um, a third of older adults actually have obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, this leads to a buildup of beta amyloid plaques in the hippocampus. And um, so we know that is one of the factors involved with developing dementia or Alzheimer's. 
So if you are a loved one is suffering from um, the, from obstructive sleep apnea, that would be a major risk factor and something to consider in terms of lifestyle change to uh, look at that. Now, our diet. You know, it's really important to note that the brain is an energy hog. So the brain you, it only weighs 2% of the body's weight, but it consumes 20% of the fuel that we eat. So that means the fuel that we eat really needs to be high quality fuel, and it needs to be what the brain needs. Um, and um, smoking is to the lungs what fat is to the heart what sugar is to the brain. So maintaining um, a diet that's low in sugar is, of course, really important. That's the quickest, fastest, easiest fuel, but it's also the worst fuel um, that we can give our brain. Just to note, because I think it's really important that uh, feeding our brain does not necessarily need to include brain supplements. Uh, many of those companies that you see advertised regularly on TV have also settled um, million dollar lawsuits over making false claims. So there is no clear evidence that the brain supplements, even those ones that we see on TV, um, actually are effective in, in uh, providing us with brain help. You know, it's funny, we are always looking for a pill that fixes this. And what we're finding with Alzheimer's is it's not one pill, it's the whole lifestyle that's involved here. So it's harder work than just opening up the medicine cabinet. In terms of eat this, these are some of the important things to consider. Green leafy vegetables, vegetables in general, fruit, which also is a source of, of sugar. Um, so that would be in moderation, soy, whole grains and green and black tea are very important. What we want to avoid is what we call the, um, the SAD diet. The SAD diet is the standard American diet. So these are the things that we don't um, want to, to eat as much of, and that's butter and margarine, pastries and sweets, fried food, and that um, is hard for uh, uh, us Southerners, but something that we need to think about and avoiding too much red and processed meat. So we want to avoid the SAD diet, standard American diet. Uh, maintaining proper glucose metabolism is important. It's also something that we can um, do by keeping our weight in check. And if this is a problem for us to have a glucose uh, monitoring and test first thing in the morning. We know that a Mediterranean style diet has been found to be very beneficial for cognitive performance um, and fish stands out as helping lower the risk of both cognitive impairment and cognitive decline. Um, so this has been shown to be the most healthy diet for our brain and one that is easier, I think, to implement um, on a regular basis. So in terms of brain foods, the things that we want to, um, to try to ensure that we're ingesting throughout the day, uh, berries, they, um, they um, help the cells communicate. They're antioxidants and help reduce inflammation. Nuts are rich in vitamin E and walnuts in particular aid in memory and learning and reducing anxiety. Um, fatty fish, um, the brain is actually 60% fat, um, and fatty fish is are rich in omega-3 fats, and this would be fish like salmon and mackerel, not like fried catfish. Eggs contain, particularly the yolks, contain choline, which um, converts to acetylcholine. That's one of the neurotransmitters in the brain that help our cells communicate. Um, when it comes to leafy greens, we want to eat the darkest greens like kale and spinach because they contain folate, which is good for the brain. Pumpkin seeds contain zinc, which aids in cell communication. 
Now, there are a lot of studies back and forth on coffee. And um, what we know is that coffee is kind of a moderation kind of a thing. Um, it does improve uh, mood and boost our energy, but too much coffee may be too much. So uh, monitor that. Uh, green and, and black tea help um, reduce anxiety and depression by almost 20% while they can improve memory and attention. Oranges are rich in vitamin C and plays a role in mood and memory and protect against stroke. Um, turmeric is a golden colored spice that we find often in um, um, Indian food and it has been shown to be an effective agent in the fight against Alzheimer's. And then dark chocolate or, uh, contain uh, flavanols, which are antioxidants, and also may play a role in decreasing um, um, depression. So, you know, I think those are some, some choices when we think about what are the most important brain foods and how we could implement those into our daily diet. You could have a, uh, an orange and a piece of dark chocolate um, as a as a snack or a lunchtime with your green tea and um, really be boosting your brain chemistry for the afternoon. I want to spend a little bit of time um, talking about the services that Alzheimer's of Central Alabama provides the community. Um, we've been helping families for 30 years. We do mainly serve the 21 counties across Central Alabama. But last year during COVID, we um, decided that if we have a request from a family that needs um, um, support or our services, that we can um, help families across the state. So keep that in mind. We've actually got um, <clears throat> people on our service programs from um, Baldwin County and someone in Montgomery County, and we're really proud of that. In um, 2022, we provided um, services for 469 people, and today we have 315 people that we're serving with our programs. You know, the first line of defense for any, um, any person um, faced with a dementia diagnosis is education, and education plays a real role in families really need it. I was at a support group in Leeds um, last night and um, you know it's just apparent that there's um, that they're they're starved for basic Alzheimer's information and the rules that we say, you know, don't reason, rationalize, argue. You know, those are important things that families need um, to hear. They need to be taught. Um, they need to um, to see us and using those types of behaviors when we are um, are dealing with someone living with dementia as well. So there are support groups around town that are very, very helpful. Um, our community calendar is the email that goes out every Friday. Um, and that's our website if you would like to um, to um, request a copy of that. We are four people working in this office and we have worked for ACA, a collective 62 years. So we know a lot about community resources. We know a lot about the disease and we're here to help. So we always encourage people to call us. Um, we support <clears throat> research at UAB and have established the Lindy Harrell Predoctoral Scholars Program for Alzheimer's Research in the Department of Neurology. Um, Dr. Harold is um, a founding member of ACA. She was the first director of the Alzheimer's Center at UAB. And this is a program designed to attract um, students to establish careers in Alzheimer's research because we need more young minds putting their, their brain power um, to work to solve the problem of Alzheimer's. Now, we have provided uh, Project Lifesaver bracelets um, to 866 people living with Alzheimer's disease. These are bracelets that emit a radio tracking signal that prevents wandering. <clears throat> it helps locate someone in the event that they wander. We know that 60% of people living with Alzheimer's will wander, and those who do tend to do so repeatedly. So, um, um, this is one tool in the toolkit. It is not for people who um, who are 
living alone or who are continuing to drive. This is not a GPS system. This is a radio tracking signal. And that's Mr. Thigpen. <clears throat> He was um, uh, forever trying to get on the bus to go downtown um, where he worked for many years shining shoes. And um, even as he, when he attended adult daycare, um, taking care of people's shoes was, was the activity that engaged him the most. Giving hope by providing respite care through scholarships to attend adult daycare. You know, we had some of our adult daycares that closed during COVID, but we have new ones that have opened up, and we also have the respite ministries that some congregations in our area have started. If you would like a list of adult daycare or respite centers, please contact our office, um, and we can provide that to you. Um, the, this is, daycare is the most affordable kind of respite care, um, more affordable than having a sitter in the home, and it also provides that sense of engagement and reduces social isolation. For the first time in a long, long time, some of our daycare centers actually have waiting lists. <clears throat> but I always encourage people, go ahead and get on the list, and they participate in a lot of fun activities and, um, and as I said, they're important for um, social engagement. And we provide um, continence care um, to families. And we currently have um, 174 uh, people living with dementia that receive the products that they need each month. Um, this includes diapers, pull-ups, bed pads, gloves, and wipes. And um, those families check in with us every month and tell us how they're doing and uh, place their order. Um, we don't currently have a waiting list for that program. And as I said, there um, we, we can serve uh, across the state with that program too. Um, there are um, applications on our website that can be downloaded and we encourage families to apply. 67% um, of the people on our program have monthly incomes that are less than um, $1,500 a month. And um, so these products are very um, necessary and very um, needed for them. Um, all of the money we raise stays in Alabama and 89 cents of every dollar we raise uh, funds our services, education and research. And that is our my our website, my personal email address, and our phone number. And as I said, we really encourage people to um, to call us anytime they've got questions because um, we we are here to help. Um, and um, we don't want people to go through this situation alone. And we can send out information to anyone um, that needs it. So thank you very much. I uh, appreciate again the opportunity to talk with you today. Thank you so much, Miller. Um, the chat is now open if you have any questions or um, you can go ahead and ask them to Miller in the remaining time that we have. And M4A has started um, uh, um, an adult daycare. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that, Marie? Maria? Yes. The Middle Alabama Area Agency on Aging um, has the Elder Justice Center located in Montevallo, Alabama, which serves as a respite center for individuals that have Alzheimer's and other um, needs so that their caregivers can have time to do um, some of those uh, chores that they might need to go out to the grocery store, for example, or um, things like that. Currently, though, um, the Elder Justice Center is closed um, due to some other unforeseen issues. That's why our in-person seminar is not happening today. Um, but as soon as we know that the Elder Justice Center will reopen, we will put it out in our newsletter. And if you have any questions about that, you can reach out to Robin James here at the 
M4A. And to get her contact information, I will put it in the chat. And um, she would be the point of contact for any of your questions about the Elder Justice Center. Um, we've got um, volunteers today coming to our office to pick up care baskets. These are baskets filled with staples. And, and then we provide um, um, meat as well that will be delivered to some of the, the families in greatest need. But one of the things that we include with our, our um, care baskets, we do this three times a year. And um, this is our, our spring delivery. But um, one of our local churches, um, Vestavia Methodist Church, makes fidget mats. Um, they're basically like a placemat, and they have sewn all kinds of doodads on these mats, and um, they are particularly helpful um, in engaging the people living with dementia. We had somebody that came up to the office and said, could I please have two? I need one in the house, and I keep one in the car, which I thought was really smart because her mother gets very agitated in the car, so um, that's important. We also provide robotic pets. I know those are less novel than they used to be and are available through um, through many organizations. In fact, they may have them in M4A, but um, these are Joy for All. That's the brand name, cats or dog. And they have really, really done a, a, a wonderful job of providing engagement opportunities for people living with dementia. And you ought to go to our website and and see um, a video of Esther and her cat, because it's a truly beautiful thing. And Esther had a lot of um, agitation, and um, that agitation manifested in, in itching and scratching, and the cat just pretty much eliminated that. Instead of scratching and picking at her arms, she just pet the cat all day. And um, so they, they can be very helpful in terms of of distraction and um, and engaging. Now there was somebody at um, at the support group last night that said her mother uh, kept her cat and loved it for a while, but then she said she didn't think she could keep it because she wasn't going to be able to take it outside enough. So um, there you go. You know, if it works, it, it works. If it only works a little while, it only works a little while. But um, the robotic pets have brought a lot of joy. I also want to say a little plug for our April 26th. We're going to be having a long-term care uh, seminar at the Elder Justice Center, um, willing that our issues at the EJC um, are fixed by then. And CEUs will also be provided at that event. Um, you can find more information about that on the M4A website. I see somebody in the, the chat box has asked, what's the charge on the fidget blankets? There is no charge. Um, you can call the church and you can go pick some up. Um, and um, they have just been very generous in providing those. And, and they're not necessarily just good for someone with, with dementia. They There might be other people who um, suffer from agitation that, that, that might um, also enjoy them. But that's a wonderful ministry of that church. Miller, I had a question about um, the baby dolls. Do you guys provide those or have connections to companies that might provide individuals with baby dolls? We have not. We have not ever. Um, um provided um dolls or, or, or I've not really even known any sources that that families have used because there's such a variety of of um of dolls out there and what might appeal to one person but that might not appeal to another but certainly for some people they work um very very well much like the cat or the dog and just um being something soothing and I think they also lend themselves to a um uh, um, they they just lend themselves to um, to engagement. So um, someone asked what the name of the church is. It, it's, let's see if I can get it. Can I get in the, let me see. I will put it in the chat. It's Vestavia um, 
Vestavia Hills Methodist Church. So, and that's in Birmingham. I don't know the exact location, but it's on Kentucky Avenue in, in Vestavia. So there you go. They have a whole closet of all these fun, I don't know, it's zippers and beads and just all sorts of things you can't even imagine. And they've got this all sorted by color. And um, there, somebody's got the address. So, um, and people just get what they need and, and, and make these mats. And it's a great, great ministry. Well, since we're we're just sitting here in silence, I will tell y'all, um, ACA has um, a fundraiser coming up May 6th. This is our garden art party. It is back after a four-year hiatus. It is a live and silent auction. It will be at the Finnick, which is near Railroad Park in downtown Birmingham. It's a lovely um, new venue that's opened um, during COVID. And um, would love for you to come and participate. Or if you're an artist or know of an artist, maybe there's something you would like to donate for the auction. But it's a, a great evening. We started this program, this um, event back in 1997 to raise money for our service programs. And so um, to me in my heart, that's always what this fundraiser is about. It's about um, raising money so that we can continue to provide um, respite care, continent supplies, and um, an insure to families. So y'all check that out on our website as well. And please remember, if you want to get um, information weekly in your in inbox um, related to a sort of an Alzheimer's roundup of research, um, to contact us and we'll add you to the Friday email. Um, and um, And you'll know all the all the new news reg regarding Alzheimer's. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us again for our April stand webinar. Be on the lookout for our May Take a Stand webinar um, coming up the first Wednesday in May. Um, our conference on the 26th, I believe, will be from 9 to 2 p.m. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, feel free to email or call M4A. Thank you so much. Thank you.